Hello class, this is Ms. Augustine, and today we are going to begin talking about scientific measurement, and this is chapter 3 in the textbook. So let's start with what a measurement is. Whenever we measure something, we're comparing one object to some standard. And in science, we use the SI units, which is the System Internationale units. Um, and so we'll be talking about those a great deal in this chapter. So there are two types of measurements that we can think about, and they are either qualitative or quantitative. So um, as a way of example, I usually say um, for a qualitative measurement, oh, that um, pencil is blue. It's a pretty shade of blue. Or I'll look at my daughter and say, she looks sick today. I think she might be sick. Where a quantitative measurement would be, oh, that blue pencil is actually um, a specific shade of blue that has a corresponding wavelength of 460 nanometers. Or I'll say, oh, my daughter is sick and I took her temperature and she has a fever of 101.2 degrees. So those are the two types of, of measurement. So when we talk about a qualitative measurement, it's a measurement that's descriptive but non-numerical. That's kind of a middle shade of blue, or you look kind of sick. Whereas a quantitative measurement is a measurement that has a definite form, numbers, and units. So that is a shade of blue that corresponds to 460 nanometers. Or someone has a fever and it's 101.3 degrees Fahrenheit. So again, quantitative measurements are definite. They have a number and they have a unit associated with it. So that leads us to talking about things called precision and accuracy. Accuracy generally refers to the agreement of a particular value or measurement to a true value. And precision refers to the degree of agreement among several measurements made in the same way. So for instance, if I measure the width of a desk and I measure it five times using the same yardstick, then my precision will be how close together that group of measurements is. So you can think about precision as um, a measure of reproducibility. So let's look at a, an example of precision and accuracy. So here are three bullseyes. So this is not a measurement, but the idea here is you're trying to shoot arrows and get to the red dot in the center, the so-called bullseye. So if we look at these three measurements, they're not at the bullseye and they're not really close together. So these three arrows are neither accurate, they're not close to where you're trying to get your target, and they're not precise, they're not close together. In the second one, the arrows are very close together, but they're not near the so-called target. So these are precise because they're close together, but not accurate because they're far from the target or accepted uh, spot. Now in this case, they're right on the bullseye, and they're all close together. So in this case, it is precise, they're close together, and they're accurate, they're close to the target value. So again, you can see when you're doing measurements, you can have a variety of outcomes. You can be not accurate, not precise, your measurements are far apart, you're not near what the true value or accepted value is. Here you're precise, your measurements are all close together, but you're far from the target. And in the third case, you are precise, your measurements are close together, and you're accurate, you're at the target. Which leads to another thing we talk about in science, uncertainty in measurements. So there's always a digit that must be estimated, and that is called uncertain. So a measurement always has some degree of uncertainty. So why is there uncertainty? Because measurements are performed with an instrument, and no instrument can read to an infinite number of decimal places. So the uncertainty gives you some 
idea of what kind of instrument was used to make the measurement. So here are three different types of uh, measurement devices. So these are all going to measure mass. And so this you might be familiar with from the junior high. This is a triple beam balance. This one can usually get to a hundredth of a gram. This looks like a scale that I would use to measure a package at the post office or to measure how many pounds of apples or oranges I was buying at the grocery store. So this is um, going to give me a measurement that's on the order of probably within a quarter pound either way. And so again, not going to give me to the hundredths place. And then this third one goes to three decimal places. So this one is going to the hundredths, excuse me, to the thousandths place. So why do I care? Well, if I'm going and I'm measuring some apples for 99 cents a pound at the Acme, um, this one's probably good enough because there are less than a dollar a pound and I don't really need to know the mass of my apples to a hundredth of a gram, and I don't really need to know them to a thousandth of a gram. However, let's say my doctor is making a an allergy serum for me, and if he puts the wrong amount in me, too much in me, I could die. So would I want him to use this one that I would use to measure my apples? Probably not. Would I want him to use this one? Also probably not. In this case, I would probably want him to use a balance that could get him to the thousandth of a gram because it's going to really matter. So again, the uncertainty tells you whether someone measured it with a piece of string or whether they measured something with a very, very um, accurate caliper in mass. Did they use the cheapo scale at the Acme or did they use an analytical balance capable of going to the thousands or the hundred thousand places. So again, uncertainty is about the type of instrument that the measurement was made on. And that leads us to how we communicate this. So when I report a number to you, um, in order for you to know whether I used the fancy scale that goes to the thousands place or whether I used the scale at the Acme, um, I'm going to communicate that to you using something called significant figures. And a significant figure is, or a significant figures are, all the digits in a measurement that are known with certainty plus one that must be estimated. The last digit always has to be estimated. So there are very specific rules for how you report sig figs or significant figures. So non-zero integers always count as significant figures. So for instance, the number 3456 has four significant figures. All of the non-zero integers count. Zeros are tricky. So we'll see that there are three different types of zeros that we encounter in measurements. So leading zeros do not count as significant figures. So for instance, the number 0 0.0486 has three significant figures. Why? Because right here, this zero is just a placeholder for the tenths place. It is not part of the measurement. Same for this zero. It's just telling you that there's nothing there. Now the reason is, if you think about it, if I give you a penny and I ask you what does that represent, you can say a penny is one one hundredth of a dollar. How can you write that in decimal form? Well, one one hundredth can only be written as point zero one. So the zero is only a placeholder, it is not significant. Now, when you have captive zeros, that means a zero sandwiched between two non-zero numbers, they are always significant figures. So here, the number 16.07 has four significant figures. This zero is a so-called captive zero, so it is significant. And then zeros for um, trailing zeros. So 
zeros that are at the right hand side of a number are trailing zeros and they are significant only if the number contains a decimal point. So the number 9.300 has four significant figures. Why are these significant? When I put that decimal point there, that means I know with certainty to the thousandths place that that is a zero. So putting the zeros there tells me that I measured this on an instrument that was capable of measuring to the thousands place. Whereas the number 9300 has only two significant figures because I was only certain to the hundredths place. So that means that by not putting in the decimal by not putting in the decimal point, I'm indicating to you that I'm not certain to that place. So again, this number only has two sig figs. If there was a decimal point there, it would have four, and that would indicate that I was certain to the ones place. And so now we have to talk about exact numbers. And exact numbers <coughs> are said to have an infinite number of significant figures. So an example, if I told you that there were 13 people in the room, that number is said to have an infinite number of sig figs. When you're counting things, they're said to be exact numbers. Also, anytime you're given a conversion fact like 1 inch equals 2.54 centimeters, that's an exact number that's said to have an infinite number of significant figures. Same thing for 12 inches equals 1 foot. Exact number. So for now, this is Ms. Augustine signing off.